Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Juliette Craig, and I'm with the Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP. And Kendall is also here from KCP, and she'll be behind the scenes today to help us with technology. And of course, we also have Dr. Rachel Holt here, who's gener generously offered to uh, be here with us today to talk about the province's draft biodiversity and ecosystem health framework. And I'll introduce her more formally in a moment. And as I mentioned, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat, including your name and organization and place or traditional territory you're joining us from today. And as you likely know, uh, the comments on this framework are due by January 31st. And last week, Rachel gave a fantastic in-person presentation in Nelson, and it was extremely well received. And she wanted an opportunity to provide this information virtually in order to reach more people. So she reached out to KCP and asked if we could host um, this session, which of course we are delighted to do. And that's why it was organized quite quickly in the last week. Um, we're thrilled by the number of participants on the Zoom today. We uh, set it up more informally as a presentation, Q&A and discussion. Um, so just be aware uh, to mute yourself during uh, most of the session, unless we've called on you if you have a question to ask or something like that. Um, on a side note, you may also know that KCP currently has our winter webinar series running in partnership with the Columbia Mountains Institute for Applied Ecology on the theme of wildlife corridors and ecological connectivity. So I'll ask Kendall to pop a link in the chat in case you wanna check out that eight part webinar series. Uh, the first one was last week, the next one's coming up this Thursday. Um, and before I introduce Rachel, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Kootenai Conservation Program. Uh, we work in the Kootenays in the Southeast corner of BC, which is the unceded homeland of the Snyaks, Schwepmek, Tunaha and Silks Okanagan peoples who have stewarded and cared for the land, water and all living things since time immemorial. We're a diverse network of more than 85 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, First Nations, local, provincial and federal government agencies, agricultural producers, land trusts and educational institutions who contribute to conserving our region. And the purpose of KCP's partnership is to cooperatively conserve and steward landscapes that sustain naturally functioning ecosystems, and also to generate the support and resources needed to maintain that effort, including sharing knowledge and expertise in information sessions like this today. So we are extremely grateful to KCP's program sponsors, including the Columbia Basin Trust, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Program, or Compensation Program, my apologies, Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, Nature Conservancy of Canada, Nature Trust of BC, and Environment and Climate Change Canada. And I'm thrilled to introduce Rachel today. Uh, Rachel grew up in the north of England, worked on research projects in Europe and the Arctic, and has now lived and raised a family in Nelson for the last 25 years. She has her own one-woman consulting company, and has focused her efforts primarily on forest management policy, ecology, and conservation of old growth forests, and large scale planning processes such as the Great Bear Rainforest. Rachel's been the vice chair of the Forest Practices Board and was recently an expert witness in the successful Supreme Court case claiming breach of treaty rights for the Blueberry River First Nation. Her key interest is in changing the management of resources in such a way that outcomes for climate, biodiversity, and communities are improved. Rachel served on the Old Growth Technical Advisory Panel, which provided recommendations that the biodiversity and ecosystem health framework has stemmed from. So today, Rachel will be providing information on the draft framework, identifying opportunities the framework potentially offers, and providing suggestions that can be used to respond to the provincial government by January 31st as they develop the next steps. So a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and we'll share the link out as soon as possible so that you can pass along to anyone else who may be interested, preferably before January 31st. Uh, we'll be hosting a Q&A at the end of this information session. So please either enter your questions directly into the chat or at the end, you can raise your virtual hand using the reactions buttons and we'll call on you to answer questions. So uh, Rachel's presentation is approximately 40 minutes, so it will leave some time for questions. 
and she's generously offered to stay for another 15 minutes um, if anyone else can, who, if there's still more questions to go. Um, you might notice your view options in the top and you may wish to go on to um, uh, the speaker view. Is there a side-by-side -side speaker view while uh, Rachel's giving her presentation? So with that, over to you, Rachel, and thank you so much. Thanks very much, Juliet, and thanks for hosting us at the last minute. Um, I uh, I titled this title, this talk, this title, because I feel like um, we all need optimism and we all need something to do. So I am going to go through here. No, I don't know. There we go. Who am I? Uh, we just, I just, we just gave a little introduction there. So um, I'm a consultant and I've worked on lots of things in BC and um, that's what I'm still doing. So I'm here today um, just to do that. A number of years ago, and I'm going to fly through this. So just, it's, it's incredible that almost 300 people signed up for basically what is a Policy Geek uh, webinar. And um, I will endeavor to not make it boring, but we are going to get into some of the details of that. Um, and I'm going to start with a little bit of history and context and then go through the framework and talk about what it is and what it isn't and, and some thoughts on it. So, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. So a few years ago, um, colleagues Karen Price and Dave Davis and I wrote this report uh, BC's Old Growth Forest, The Last Stand for Biodiversity, and we published it um, as well. And we came to the astonishing and detailed confusion that not all old forest is created equal. And we said, there's lots of this out there, and there's not so much of this out there. And the provincial government has an industry have tended to pretend that they're the same thing. And we identified major policy gaps in how the forest managed to look at representation. And so, you know, we're still struggling to get these incredibly basic messages back into government and have them be reflected in the work and actions that take place. And so this current set of work, I think, is the next opportunity to do that. Um, of course, the management of forests is not the only ecological gap out there issues or management concerns. Um, this is my short list of things. We don't have endangered species, effective endangered species. Um, we don't have ecological community protection. We have protection for most species that have been limited by timber supply caps. We don't think about carbon in any management decision at all. Um, we think about making money first, not whether it makes sense for communities or the ecosystem i.e. The, the development of the major uh, export business on pellets. Mining tends to be outside any rules we do have. Oil and gas development has tended to be outside of the rules that we do have. We have poor cumulative effects management as was by the Blue Bay, uh court case decision. And we don't have any planning around resorts and how they mesh with all of the rest of the world. So there's a whole bunch of things that we need to look at out there. Why am I here? I don't work for the provincial government. It, this is not my responsibility. I'm not advocating on government's behalf. I'm not doing any of those things. But after 30 years doing this work, I have some cautious optimism. So um, my interest is in sharing that because we all need cautious optimism. So just a little context. Um, in 2020, these guys wrote this report. You're all super familiar with it, the old growth View. They had a whole bunch of recommendations. Two of them, well, the first one was First Nations need to be centered. Um, the two that I'm focusing on here are uh, they talked about deferring at risk old forest and they talked about a paradigm shift for forest management. And this work is stemming out of these recommendations. And, you know, in terms of whether there is actually a need for optimism out there, what I've seen is that. There has been a significant shift in language. Um, you know, we have a premier talking about exhausted forests. That's a very unusual position to be in. But there's a lot of talk about industry shifting uh, to higher value, lower volume um, endeavors. Um, I have personally watched a shift, although there's lots of gaps still in terms of how the province is engaging with nations. So I see positivity there. Um, in the global sense, 
back in 93, we had the Rio Earth Summit, and that from that stemmed the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, more recently, we've had the update of that. Um, that has led to Canada, for instance, signing on to a framework that actually looks quite similar to this one that I'm going to talk about today. In the global stage, there is an increasing um, increasing uh, acknowledgement of the fact that a failure to manage for biodiversity and climate will be catastrophic. And it, th there's some kind of twisted irony about the fact that an increasing acknowledgement of this dire state is a reason for optimism, but sadly that's where we're at. So I'm gonna take what you can and, and run with the optimism. Um, just a little too few summary points. In terms of old growth deferrals, um, it's hard to know whether to be positive or negative. They've happened. That's good. Um, there's extremely variable implementation across the province. There's definitely poor transparency on how that's happened. There's been a tendency to still push those into the non-contributing land base so that they weren't really deferrals because if you defer something that wasn't at risk, it's not a deferral. Uh, in some places like the Kootenays, there's actually been good, um, pretty good take up of the deferrals and they were having an effect. So this has been, uh, this is a piece of work that has had some positive and some less positive elements from its implementation. The, uh, without unduly impacting the timber supply of the province, this clause that effectively limited what we could do in British Columbia has now in fact been deleted both in the general policy and in the GAR orders affecting wildlife. That second change happened just before Christmas. Quietly, it's, this is a very positive thing. Of course, it doesn't actually do anything at all. So we needed it to happen. It's very important that it has happened and it signals change and a desire to change, but it does nothing in itself. Now we need new forest and wildlife targets to reflect the use. So that, that is a positive thing. <clears throat> Uh, $10 million was set aside to try and promote alternative silviculture by stopping clear cutting. Um, nothing has happened yet on the ground. We need incentive to do it. Um, there's lots and lots of talk, but nothing has happened on this. I believe BCTS were pushed towards this a um, couple of years ago, but we've not seen change there on the ground. There's conservation financing, and that's great. Nobody quite knows how that's going to play out and what it's going to finance and how that's going to work across the board, but um, money is, well, I rarely say money is good, but in this case, money is good. And now we get to the subject for today, which is the ecosystem health framework on the province. Um, it was released in November and it's open for public comment for another week. Um, and now I'm going to go through it. It's only 14 pages long. So if you were hoping for a 200 page document, this is not, not your document. Um, I think that's probably a good thing. It's high level, it's trying to set direction and um, you should read it, it's interesting. It's available on the web if you just search it out. Um, just from a starting perspective, there's a message from the minister, Minister Cullen, and it says the province's biodiversity and ecosystems are under threat. It says they're essential for health and well-being. And not only to themselves, but for ecosystems, economies, and communities. Um, and that we need conservation and recovery of species at risk. And it will also set the path for co development and implementation of new policies, legislation, and strategies. And, you know, I have to say that the, my answer to that is wow, we haven't seen this kind of message out of government ever from my perspective and so this is a this is a strong um uh, a strong opening so uh, as i'm going to go through this i'm going to talk about a section of the strategy and then make some suggested comments from my perspective you know this is a this is a big deal i think it re requires some applause some congratulations it's been a little slow but then turning the ship around is also always slow now, though, we need to make it real. So these are great words. Let's make them real. In terms of its intent, the British Columbia government commits to the conservation and management of ecosystem health and biodiversity 
as an overarching priority and will formalize this priority through legislation and other enabling tools that apply to all sectors. Again, that is a very strong statement of intent and I believe should be congratulated. Um, this was committed to in the sense that the government signed on to the um, uh, recommendations in the OGSR, but this is a more formal recommitment to this intent. Um, of course, making it real means it has to be overarching. So from a comment perspective, this is great. And it has to overarch all the other pieces of legislation out there. And I think a really a critical question and one that needs to be focused in on, on with laser sharp uh, clarity is how will government ensure that government and industry are held accountable to this strategy? Because that will be the, a key piece of implementation. And I'll just, I'm going to go through this piece. Now, the, the, instead of reading it, you can all go away and read it later. And I'm just going to summarize each of these pieces as we, as we go along. So there's a framework foundation, and that is UNDRIP and Ripper. And um, that is a very positive piece. And then there's three basic pillars, um, taking a whole government approach, focusing on a whole of society approach, and adopting an open and transparent process. And I'm going to talk about each of those separately as we go along. So it's very positive that government is, provincial government is centering First Nations government uh, in this strategy. Um, Co-development so far, I have seen more work, more effort trying to do a real co-development work and engage with nations um, than I've seen before. Uh, in, the, in reality, in terms of who's holding the pen, um, those efforts have been relatively limited to date. Um, I think that's a complicated thing to do. And so there needs to be more of that and there needs to be sufficient capacity funding for, for nations in order to actually make this a co-developed piece of work. And in general, those three pillars, the one and three have a fair bit of substance to them and pillar two is pretty high level. So it's fairly hard to know how to get to that. So the framework sets the stage for a desired transformation shift. And it recognizes that that is needed to end up with strong, stable, prosperous communities and economies at the end of the day. And this is, I think, a real effort to move away from the jobs versus environment uh, situation that we have often found ourselves in. It's an acknowledgement of this hierarchy and you know, that is that is positive. We have rarely seen that kind of messaging. We often are find that these values get pitted against each other, uh, which ends up in usually um, both communities, nations, and ecosystems doing badly. So it's good to see this. Um, they have a section on creating conditions for change. And, you know, there's it this this is a basically just realistic about the challenge. It's good to see that um, because if we thought this was easy, then you know they weren't planning to do it. It can't be easy. So realism is good. Um, again, we need to figure out how Ministry of Forest, Ministry of Mines, and Emily are going to be brought into alignment and held accountable within this framework. Um, you know, those those different ministries have a different mandate and. There's always been an ongoing bun fight between the different ministries in the province. We know that. We, we witness it. We see it. There's, the balance of power has been elsewhere historically, and this suggests there's going to be a change in that. Um, there have to be clear lines of authority uh, to override the existing decision making in order for this to be effective peace. And there are going to be slow adopters, both perhaps on... <laughs> in the sense of individual people uh, in the different ministries. There are obviously people in all ministries who are on board with this work. And there's obviously people who are not. Um, there may be entire ministries who are hard to get on board and there may be individual people who are hard to get on board. And that will be a challenge for the provincial government to really tackle that issue. Um, so this is a policy geek out. So uh, this is your relief. For the moment, just read the cartoon and enjoy it. 
because in case anybody thinks I've gone completely mad, I haven't lost the fact that um, there is always ways out of this thing. And there's always people who are not trying to do the right thing. And um, so, you know, just don't be fooled by the idea that I'm being all positive. Um, there is a we need we need optimism tinged with a with a little reality check of the scope of how much we have to change in order to have this be reality. Okay, hopefully you're done reading my one of my favorite comics off the web. So pillar one, taking a whole of government approach. What does that mean? These words actually come out of um, the. Uh, Convention on Biological Diversity and the, and the work that has stemmed out of them. These are similar words that the federal government uses. Um, so how do we make this stuff real? What does whole of government mean? This work started out focusing on forest policy and old growth. And now the province has said, we're gonna take a whole of government approach. So what does that mean? That means that we have to consider the whole kit and caboodle, pellets, resorts, oil and gas, LNG, like how does all of that fit within this framework? Um, how is it going to be measured? At what scale is it going to be measured? You know, I think when this work started, we were talking about stands of trees, but actually we need to consider the biggest threat to biodiversity and communities in British Columbia is climate change. So if we do not consider, for instance, carbon and the trajectory of carbon in our forests, forests are the largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gas in British Columbia, and ha they're harvesting, even without considering wildfires, forest harvesting commit uh, gives out more greenhouse gas than anything else. We don't consider that at all. In fact, we still play gaming, gaming with the, that kind of information. And so, you know, whole of government means doing a good job of this bigger picture. And of course, there are different strategies that are in play in British Columbia right now that potentially head in the opposite direction. So how will these things come together? I'll come back to that in a minute. So this pillar one, this is some of the detail. I'm just gonna go through the detail of what it says. Um, again, don't read it here, read it at home afterwards. They say they're going to establish an office of biodiversity and ecosystem health and put in place potentially a chief ecologist with some power. Um, they're going to focus on data. They're going to set objectives and standards, and they're going to champion and become accountable for these pieces being laid out. On the second page of that, they're going to develop a new law co-developed with First Nations. They're going to align across all the programs that deal with land and other pieces uh, of management. And they're going to set this direction and, and give it to the ongoing planning work that's ongoing. And they're going to use ecosystem-based management, cumulative effects management, restoration. They're going to center parks and protected areas, and they're going to look to develop, end up with resilient communities. Um, all of these things, this is quite a substantive pillar. Um, I think there's a need to applaud the general approach um, the, the idea of having a biodiversity and ecosystem health office is a very positive one. Um, hopefully that can be put in place in the short term. It needs to be ready for action um, going forward. This office needs to be overarching and have the actual power to do its job. And so it has to be structured in such a way that all major decisions and policy direction actually funnel through this office. If, if major decisions are still made individually within ministries, then its ability to be effective will be very limited. And, you know, in the short term, what we have is a whole bunch of decision makers out there who are not following this notion. And so I think as an immediate action, there needs to be a strong signal to existing statutory decision makers that the leaning of how decisions are made need to change to reflect this, um, this commitment. So just more on this piece, um, the new law that is being proposed, that's very positive. It needs to be cross-sector and it needs teeth. Um, there need to be new tools under that law in order to be effective, and it has to include ecosystem, which is something that we don't 
currently have in BC. There has to be appropriate oversight and accountability of the decision makers below that feeds into this. And so again, I repeat, it needs this overarching status. Um, the standards that will be developed have to embrace both science and indigenous knowledge. And you know, the crux of the thing will come down to this last bullet, really, ecosystem health. It has to be defined really using um, really rigorous approach and uh, it needs to be, this the, determining the, this piece will be really critical going forward. You know, it's an interesting thing because the, the province has uh, its cumulative effects program um, that has done relatively little out in the real world, but they have developed a whole bunch of standards. So for instance, they have developed a biodiversity protocol uh, I have worked on it, you know, probably over the last 15 years it's been in development. Um, it exists today, it's signed off that protocol, but it's actually not used for anything. It doesn't exist on the website as they have run, in fact, the biodiversity protocol for the whole province. Um, it shows that the biodiversity of the province is at risk and it would provide a really good starting place as a standard to understand the direction that we need to go in. Um, there is also an aquatic biodiversity protocol that can be used in a similar way. And, you know, that work needs to quickly come to the fore in order to be uh, in to, in to inform this work. Again, all right, let's have another little moment of break. Of course, there are many examples where you get into these situations where the truth is basically shouted down by somebody repeating something that doesn't make any sense. And yet these things continue to drive our policy. We talk about sequestration rates of little trees when we are harvesting trees that have the most carbon of practically any trees in the world and also have the most stable long-term storage potential in the wet, wetter ecosystems of the province. And yet we don't consider those in a real way. So if this thing is going to be real, we have to, this office needs to deal with some of these myths and tackle them straightforwardly and actually put some real sense into, into some of this decision making. Pillar two talks about uh, supporting a broader whole of society approach. And then there's not a whole bunch underneath that. So it sounds great. There's not a lot of substance to comment on. Um, I think it's important that we don't get lost in this, although it is an important piece because we actually have to collectively as a society support this work and that's an important thing. You know, so one of the things that I think is possibly a useful thing is to fund an education program in the, in the broader sense. I suspect that most people who are on this call didn't actually need a paradigm shift, but there's people who do. And so, um, George Monbiot wrote a piece that said, Vive la France, which I'm from the north of England, so I would never repeat that normally. But here I will repeat his article. Um, he basically said, you know, we need, France has uh, a ministry for ecological plans. And France basically put a whole bunch of money into educating the people in the provincial government, in their government, about the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis in order for people to be more on page. And, this kind of work, although, you know, I think it's probably really necessary that we do this work because um, we've all watched, we've watched the conversation change, I think, collectively out there, um, but there's still big time naysayers and some of them will never change their minds. But there's a lot of people in the middle who don't really have a good sense of why this is important. And uh, there's probably some work to be done around that. Pillar three talks about adopting an open and transparent process. And, um, you know, I think in a way, this is going to require more change than almost anything else. Um, things do not operate like that today. For instance, things like this media release that sends some of us through the roof in terms of blood pressure. Um, you know, there is a strong desire to say that we're doing well when we're not doing well, when we're, when we haven't changed anything. This particular media release is just an example, just ignore it. But, you know, when the province uh, first released the Part 13 deferrals, 
half of them at least were not even areas that were at risk. And so there is a strong desire still to claim that we have moved forward when we haven't. Um, throughout the, the old growth deferrals, there's been a very uneven handling of data. Um, there's no new mapping. Areas have been taken off the map. Nobody knows where. Um, we had to take areas off the map if old growth was not found in that place, but they didn't allow areas to be added to the maps when they were in fact found. And so this lack of overall transparency is a real problem and it's a real trust issue. And I think government needs to take this really seriously if they're gonna do this work. So um, this pillar three section uh, has an implementation plan uh, outlined and they're going to identify some interim measures. So understanding that they have committed to new legislation, that new legislation will not come onto the books until the a next mandate. So um, the NDP have to win the next election and have the ability to do this work going forward. So in the interim, we need some potential interim measures and it talks about that here. Um, they want to develop an oversight system and they want to report out on how well they're doing. So implementation plan, we're all sick of these reports, let's get on with it, but that's what's coming, so fine, but let's get on with the work. Uh, in terms of oversight, it's fairly weak and minimal, and I'm not quite sure how that's going to play out, so that needs to be strengthened. And reporting is good and needed, but let's not get lost in that either. Um, one of the most robust sections in this pillar three is the need for interim measures. And you know we need clear and transparent impl implementation of those interim measures. Um, so in my mind, there's two kind of buckets of things that need to be dealt with um, in the short term. One is we have this legacy of impacts that come from the previous regime. You know, I said at the beginning that we've got rid of that those timber supply caps. That is great, but of course, none of the targets that were set as a result of them have changed. So. You know, in particular, there is egregious targets like the one third drawdown, uh, which meant that for uh, you were supposed to meet if you had a nine percent old forest target, then you could meet two thirds of that target in 250 years from now. That's a ludicrous notion. So many, 45 percent of the province have this drawdown of targets applied to it. And uh, that is something that should be struck down. Um, in many parts of the province, I'm standing in Kootenays, where um, something like 20% of the old growth management areas are actually all made up of old growth, and yet there's old growth outside those old growth management areas. You know, that needs to be fixed you know, to prevent loss of that in the short term. Um, that is a broader provincial issue um, with variation around the province in terms of how bad it is. Um, I suggest that all the remaining big tree, old growth, big and big tree, old growth as defined by the technical advisory panel should be off limits because the amount left is extremely tiny compared to what naturally would have been there. And those ecosystems are at extreme high risk today. Um, so that's the legacy impacts piece. In terms of ongoing threats, um, I suggest that we implement, I have suggested this for a long time, but that we implement a chain of custody for waste because we're in this bizarre situation that we are developing um, these bioenergy and bioproduct pieces that potentially could be very positive, but only if they are actually using waste. If they increase the pressure on the forest, then this is not going to be a good solution. Um, wood waste, the, the issue of pellets is a whole other talk, I will, I will not dive off into that, but you know, if a sawmill creates waste, if you use that to make pellets and you heat your local school, whoa, two tons of snow just fell off my roof, sorry, that was good. Um, if you use that to, to heat your local school, then that can be carbon neutral, but making pellets out of deciduous trees and shipping them to Europe, that is not carbon neutral. So we need to get a handle on that piece. That's the kind of thing that will feed into, into a place where you've got strategies that are at odds with each other. Um, in terms of big ongoing threats, we should not be making big decisions about things in the short term until this thing is in place. So for instance, 
result developments that are isolated for places that have uh, rare species, caribou that are practically uh, gone, and uh, grizzly bears in the south of the interior, you know, those things should be put on hold until we have a strategy that we're actually evaluating effects. And frankly, I think, you know, you should think about the thing that worries you most and put it in here, uh, suggest to the government that they come up with an interim strategy to deal with it. So I'm almost at the end. Um, in terms of overall comments on the framework, just wrapping this up, you know, in the big picture, I welcome and applaud the work. Um, there's good people working on this, trying to do very positive things. And I think that the whole framing of the, of the work is really very positive. Um, this new legislation is absolutely critical. And, you know, I think one of the hardest pieces is for government to take charge within government and to lay out a structure and the authorities, they have to be overarching so that this can work. Um, it must be truly co-developed with nations. Otherwise, it won't be effective. Um, new tools are gonna to be needed. And this is really an opportunity for global leadership on some of these pieces where the world is struggling with um, a lot of these same issues. And at the same time, we have to recognize that the, <laughs> the threats out there are actually changing. And there needs to be action on day one. Otherwise, people will have a hard time continuing to support it. So sickly, I think those are the big three. This thing must have teeth. It has to be overarching. And we need to, like the staff need to be got on board or choose your, choose your word. I think there's another piece to this. Um, we cannot ignore the enabling measures. So they are asking for comments on the framework but there's a bit of a tendency to be a bit focused on the framework and needs to be the other pieces have to come into play. Otherwise, this will be really hard to uh, get over the line in a meaningful way. Um, the issue of the fact that we still send wood um, overseas, we have you know this little, little piece here. Um, if you ship your wood more than 3,000 miles, it's exempt from taxes, that were intended to drive volume to stay in British Columbia. These things were put in place in the last government. They have not been changed. If we're serious, we need to actually deal with some of these things that were developed specifically for individual companies. Let's be really clear about how these things happened in the past. But we need to deal with actual uh, keeping wood in British Columbia. And not only that, but we need to focus that on the value added industry. And, you know, um, I believe there was a move to take pellets off the list of value added. Um, it was on there. I don't know if it's actually changed, but we need to get real about this and actually develop and deliver volume to places like Kolesnikov who are actually getting five or 10 times the number of jobs per tree cut. And that, that's, that's the way out of this. We know without this framework, that the timber supply of the province is declining anyway. Um, with these changes, it will decline further. And we have done a really poor job of developing the community part of the forest industry. And that's, that is one of the key things that we need to enable this going forward. Um, the province is not at this moment looking at revising the timber supply review process, which desperately needs an overhaul and the appraisal system, which also needs an overhaul in terms of moving these pieces forward. Um, I think they, uh, although I appreciate the kind of overwhelming nature of changing everything all at the, time, all at the same time, it's actually really important that these, some of these key um, processes are open uh, and change. So th they, they also need to be dealt with. And, you know, we need to get away from this. This is the rhetoric I personally feel like I'm watching the rhetoric change. I've seen less of this coming forward, but I would bet we'll get more of this coming forward as this strategy goes forward. Um, I encourage people to let their MLAs know that this matters to them and um, to send specific comments back into the ministry. Uh, that is me done and I will stop sharing and uh, answer questions, thanks.
Thank you so much, Rachel. This is really fantastic to have your knowledge and perspective. Um, I, I just want to apologize to some folks. Uh, this is in the recording that our Zoom account only allowed for 100 participants. We didn't realize that. So there are a lot of people registered who weren't able to make it on the session. So we did record it. We are recording it and we'll send out that link as quickly as possible so um, everyone can share it. There are some questions in the chat and I'll do those first. If anyone else has a question in the chat, they can pop it in there. If they'd like to ask it in person, you can use the reactions to raise your hand or just say, identify that you'd like to ask it in person. But one uh, quick question is, will the PowerPoint you just used be available? Um, no, I won't send it around because um, it's full of all the little animations and things. I think because you can rewatch the um, I did. So I did make a PDF of just the recommendations, which I could send around. I could send it to you uh, if you want, but I won't send the PowerPoint around. And um, yeah. but because it's available again, you can just scroll through it and watch it, and, and pick up anything that you missed. If you're willing to send that PDF, then we can send it out to uh, anyone who registered for the session as well. So we'll do that when we send a link to the recording. Um, a question, will this uh, new framework affect small fee simple private, I'm assuming they mean private landowners? Uh, well, no, no, not, um, not in principle, um, because that's not how management of British Columbia works. Um, I do think that there is some key, um, key direction that could be given around some of the obvious loopholes uh, and, and issues around private land. Private land in BC tends to be sitting on the most biodiverse and most important valley bottoms, particularly in the southern interior and on the south coast. Um, you know, a potential just dealing with connectivity issues and private land logging issues is critical. I don't know the ability of the province to really engage in that, but um, I suggest you I suggest you recommend that it needs to deal with it. I see you have your hand up, Stephen. We'll get to you in a moment. I'd like to um, and just ask these questions in the chat first, and then I'll loop back to you. Um, a comment from Pam Zevit. Ironically, species at, at risk is only mentioned in the minister's message, nowhere else in the framework. So it will be interesting to see if the province, uh, provincial government will be willing to move forward with dedicated species at risk critical habitat legislation, which we've been waiting for since changes were proposed but never enacted to the Wildlife Act in the mid 2000s. Any comment around that? Um, yes, I mean, I know in various versions of this thing as it went along, it went from being a big document to being a small document. Um, and um, clearly they cannot they cannot deal with biodiversity and ecosystem health without thinking about biodiversity. So in some form or other, um, there needs to be a, a direct dealing with that issue. You know, it, it's, it's, I think it is worth always asking, um, what is the most effective thing that we can do? Because if we go back to individual species management, um, then we'll end up, I mean, you know, let's look at how effective Sarah has been at the federal level. I know it's got its own limitations too. Um, I, I am, I personally am heartened by the fact that it says biodiversity and ecosystem health because we have to put the effective cost filter in place. If if we had real old forest targets, if we actually did the work that we said we were going to do 25 years ago around partial cutting for caribou, if we had done those things we wouldn't need an individual species at risk thing for caribou. We, we, my caribou who have gone from my backyard potentially would still be here. Um, I think that bigger picture framework and just taking the whole pressure off is actually a focus. And if we end up in the minutiae of individual species, then we can get lost uh, in that. We can get lost in that, in that, in that process. Not to say that I don't think it's an important piece, but I, I am heartened by the fact that we have we don't usually talk about maintaining ecosystems, communities like that piece is, is the fundamental fundamental piece to me. Um, another question: Is there any connection between the biodiversity and ecosystem health 
and the watershed security strategy with with which we have not yet seen. Well, exactly. That's the commonality. There's a whole bunch of great words and not a whole bunch of action. So <laughs> they are both talking about good potential things that could happen. And uh, they neither of them have hit the ground yet. So, I mean, these are the things that need to come together, along with the Minister's Advisory Council on Wildlife, which is, you know, doing this other thing outside of this piece. Uh, I don't know quite how they are planning to bring these things together, but presumably they would come together through this office. Um, another comment from Pam. Um, Rachel, per your cheeky graphic on wolverines, theoretically the Professional Governance Act should have an important role to play in situations like these. Lack of due diligence, loopholes over trying to plan for wide ranging uh, cryptic species. Comment yes, yes, well, I mean, how many of us have time to put in complaints that we would like to put in every day about stuff that we see that is not good? And, um, you know, it, the bird, it, the Professional Governance Act is potentially good. I'm unaware of it, again, doing anything positive uh, out there. And I don't know of any examples of people being held to it. So um, everybody needs to be brought along in these things. You know, I worry about, I just did the professional ethics course from the Association of Professional Biologists, which concerned me greatly because it tells me that I probably shouldn't give this talk. And it tells me if I'm, if I'm wary of my future as a professional biologist, I need to be quiet. Other people need to make decisions. And, you know, so I, I do think that all of these professional associations and, and, and that whole picture needs to come into this tent and under this umbrella and appreciate these big picture issues. We have a lot of uh, guidance. We have a stewardship guidance under the Professional Forces Act. We have stewardship through the professional biologists. And yet we all know that I will not finish the sentence. You can make it up for yourself. We all know that there are issues. Yeah. Another question, how do we prevent the retention of the current annual allowable cut in light of the conservation and many values in special areas? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple of, there's a couple of issues around uh, the AAC determination process. It, uh, so from a philosophical perspective, it is a quite a good process. You know, you decide over here what your rules are going to be, you model the rules, and you determine your sustainable harvest level. So, you know, conceptually, that is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, the rules have sucked from a maintaining values perspective. So we change the rules, you model them in the new process, and you get a lower harvest level. I mean, so that. That is, in fact, happening around the province through these forest landscape planning processes. The second part of the AAC issue that is a problem is that, in general, the approach and the assumptions that have been put into those models, they tend to be optimistic around timber. So, for instance, incorporation of new uh, growth curves for our future wood supply suggests that there's going to be between 10 and 40 percent more volume going forward than we thought there was a minute ago. But these kind of assumptions have been used to prop up the existing cut. When we know there's an increasing disparity between what's possible out there, you know, so I think there needs to be a review of the TSR process in light of being precautionary around ecosystem health. And at the same time, we need to change the rules, which this framework talks about. Um, both things are possible. It's not complicated to do this. Um, Thank you. Why don't we go to you, David, with your hand, a virtual hand up, and then we'll go back to some questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. It's David, David Stevenson. Um, I worked for 25 years during the Forest Practices Code Act development, and I was actively involved in working with that. Um, one thing that we're going to have to do is to 
not do what we did in this province, which is to implement it with good teeth, with good management for the forest and for the environment and for the wildlife. And then within a year, start cutting the legislation so that it no longer had teeth. We need yeah. to test it fully uh, for two or three years, whatever legislation we come up with, and then come up with, make, make changes that are appropriate rather than writing off the whole legislation. And Absolutely. after Harcourt, after Harcourt stepped down, then we had Glenn come in and then we had uh, uh, Hart, uh, the so-called, anyway, we had a loss of our government and we ended up with losing the whole Forest Practices Code Act. And now when I look at the forest, it's clear cutting. There are no wildlife tree patches. There's no protection for fish along the side of the creeks, even though theoretically they're supposed to be protected. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you Enough. know, I think we need to remember that um, this is a fleeting opportunity as these things are. We were on the cusp of this in 1996. Um, there was a lot of conversation around shifting the forest industry so that we shifted to a more value added industry. And then basically the government lost. And so that's the thing. Do not be complacent going forward. Uh, issues that there are, I am I am not advocating on behalf of the NDP, but we have to get this through the next election and actually move this forward. And this is our biggest, um, this is our big opportunity to do that, but it will take everybody's push to get us there. Um, I see your hand up, Marlene. I'm going to go to a couple of questions in the chat and then circle back to you. So another question, is BC Parks expected to secure some areas of high biodiversity? I don't have an answer to that. I don't I don't know. I mean, they 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 talk about the potential for parks. They actually don't mention indigenous protected and conserved areas, which is, I think, just an, frankly, an oversight in the document. But obviously, it needs to it needs to incorporate those for sure that if they get established, which they some of them are, then they will count them. Um, so I I think that will be part of the strategy. Kind of has to be. And a question that links to that, where does the framework provide a process for setting aside 30%? And if not, why not? Yeah, I can't answer that. Um, it's high level. Um, I, you know, one of, the, one of the implementation rollout pieces is this forest landscape planning, which is being managed at a lower level through nations in different parts of the province. Um, I happen to be involved in one of those on behalf of a nation. You know that that process is going to go through and identify places to uh, set aside, at least in the short term. Um, there's lots of work to be done to bring the temporal scales of these things together so, so that they really work. Because that FLP planning is short term; it's on a 10-year basis. Um, there's all kinds of gaps with doing that. Um, setting aside forest in the long term can be used by nations to claim carbon. Uh, credits, for example, and you can't do that through FLP planning. Um, so uh, what the government is thinking about that, I don't have an answer. I'll do one more in the chat and then over to you, Marlene, and then I'll officially wrap up at one, but we can stay on for another 15 minutes and continue uh, with questions for anyone else who's available. So one other question, there's a reference to ecological integrity and ecological resilience. Do you have any insights why ecological connectivity necessary for biodiversity and ecosystem health is not specifically mentioned? Um, no, I don't, I don't have an answer to that, except that um, it's obviously part of both of those things. And so I don't worry about it not being included in this high level document as we get to an implementation plan, um, then, then we want to see those kind of words, but uh, all right, um, just being conscious of time, Marlene, do you wanna ask your question or make your comment? And you're muted right now. Marlene. You're muted, Marlene. I know, I know, oh, sorry about that. 
Uh, thanks, Rachel, for that wonderful primer. That that was just absolutely awesome. I just wanted to say uh, I'm preparing a submission right now on behalf of the Tanaha Nation. And as part of that, I've had a number of discussions with licensees at various referral tables where we've talked about this framework. And one of the things that really alarms me is that many licensees are equating ecosystem health with forest health. And I would, and when I say that, I mean they're looking at this framework as a potential opportunity to uh, increase their rate of harvest to address accelerating climate change and the increase in wildfires, insects, diseases, blowdown uh, at a reduced stumpage rate. So, in fact, harvest more at cost less money. And uh, I've just been absolutely gobsmacked by this attitude. And I would just encourage everyone to, in their submissions that they make, to really draw the distinction between ecosystem health, a much more sort of overarching concept, than pure, you know, forest health, which is where uh, a lot of foresters that I've been talking to are going with this. So we really need to be clear on our definitions and what the scope of what we're talking about is to ensure that it is not misinterpreted in a manner that could actually backfire on us. Yeah, mm. I totally spot that and I've seen it. I've seen the chief forester of the province equate those things and that is really problematic and that's where education is needed. So yeah. the people who wrote the strategy do not think that. Um, I have seen no evidence that that is true, but of course, that's why we have the that's why it has to be overarching, and that's why there needs to be um, broader education around the differences between some of these things, of course. Um, yeah. And just on a closing note, uh, we've been, of course, reviewing FSPs as they come up. And in the new FSPs, well, the, the unduly reducing uh, timber uh, has come out, or licensees are still using it. And they're having to be informed that that clause is gone from GAR and the Forest Practices and Planning Regulation, but but they're not willing to put in any kind of draft uh, biodiversity and ecosystem health strategy because they say it's not finalized. And I'm really wondering what will happen when you've got these signed off FSPs, because a lot of them are turning over right now. And I anticipate this legislation is going to take a while longer. And we need to make sure that when this legislation passes, that anything that was signed off before then is immediately revoked and that we all start from square one, irrespective of what commitments government made to licensees when they signed off FSPs. So just another thing to mention. <clears throat> just in, in uh, recognition of the time and for those people slipping this in in lunch hour, I just want to officially thank um, Rachel so much for her time and uh, her sharing her expertise today. As I mentioned, she'll stay on for another um, 15 minutes for anyone who has, we'll keep going through the questions. Yes, a virtual applause to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. And as I mentioned, you'll be emailed a link to the recording. So please do share it widely, especially with those folks who didn't make it on onto the Zoom today. And uh, another reminder that KCP is uh, hosting our current winter webinar series in partnership with the Columbia Mountains Institute for Applied Ecology on the theme of wildlife corridors and ecological connectivity. And Kendall will put that link in the chat. Um, our second webinar of the eight part series is coming up this Thursday. Uh, so if you're interested in attending, I encourage you to do that. So um, thank you officially to everyone. And I will continue to go through the questions though for anyone who is able to stay. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, another comment, I think. In the sessions for local governments, we asked the province to flip their ask about how external audiences can support and help advance the process. Many organizations and other levels of government, regional, municipal, and Indigenous, are already hard at work on biodiversity conservation actions, but lack capacity and funding to achieve desired outcomes. Aside from compelling and enabling legislation, dedicated funding is needed. It's critical this process doesn't become shelf art the way previous iterations of strategies and frameworks have become. I don't know if you have a comment on that, Rachel, at all. Nope, I have no comment, Regine. Okay. 
Um, we've been asked if participants of the webinar will be compensated. Uh, KCP doesn't compensate participants of webinars. We do have a compensation uh, pro uh, protocol for First Nations in this region. Uh, so if you are a, of a First Nation in this region, you can contact us directly. Um, just going through. Uh, can you provide the link to access the biodiversity approach protocol, which I, you say is already available? Okay, I did. You. I just put it in the chat. Okay. Uh, can you comment on this? BC Premier David Ebby has named Andrew Merce, Mercier as Minister of State for Sustainable yeah, I can't. I can't comment because I don't know okay. them, and um, I don't have any personal comment on it. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. I wish I did. It's. I, I, I think it's an important issue and you know it it um you know one of the things that i mentioned was a strong need to um get the right people in the right roles and i mean it really is um it really is critical you know i heard that uh the chief forester of a major licensee was on the hiring committee of the current Chief Forester of the British of British Columbia, you know we have to change how things work in the province. We have to put people who are interested in these outcomes in these roles, and it frankly is indicative of government's commitment um, if the right people or the wrong people are, are put in these positions. So um, I think I think letting government know that these things reduce trust massively um, if they're the wrong wrong hires, I, I can't comment on that particular piece, but um, I, they need to know that everybody is watching these things. And uh, I think it's really an important, uh, important point. Um, Rachel, there doesn't seem to be any indication that aquatic ecosystems, so wetlands, rivers and lakes would get the same attention. How can this be emphasized? Yeah, I, to, it is complete. It's in the same way you can't talk about ecosystem health in British Columbia without talking about connectivity, then aquatic riparian, hydro riparian systems, they're all part of that same thing. Um, certainly in the FLP that I'm involved in, uh, improving um, management around aquatic systems is central to the nations involved. So uh, to me, it is in fact, of course, included. Um, and so, you know, that, that that is something, if you feel like it's lacking in the in the document, then you should let the province know that you think that you're worried that they're going to miss out on it. But um, to me, it is there. And I think I've I think I've got through all the questions. There's definitely some comments and discussion, and a lot of kudos and thank yous to you, Rachel. If I have missed your question, um, maybe you could just raise your virtual hand or type it in the chat again. I'm just trying to track track it there. All right. Otherwise, I will assume we've covered all the questions and um, and discussion. And I just want to say thank you again so much. We feel very, very lucky to have you in this region, Rachel, and your willingness to share your knowledge and expertise um, so that we can be more informed as we do respond to this framework. And I hope everybody in this session will. I think it's a really exciting opportunity in the province. And, um, and I hope we take advantage of that. So thank you again so much. Rachel. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. All right.